Now for a game that wasn't made before the year 2000, even though it probably looks and feels like it was, Shovel Knight. First thing that I like to do though is edit my controls, because having the special weapons be up and attack, I get that that's kind of the Castlevania thing, but it's not really my jam. I don't like it that way. I also like to have my uh, weapon switching buttons be the triangle and circle positions on a PlayStation controller for some reason. I'm just weird like that. That's how it fits. And I am playing on the PlayStation 3 version, um, which does have some meaning to it, but I'll get into that later. I also have the uh, buttons set up so that my usage and uh, menu for bringing up my special weapons are like R2 and L2 respectively, just because my controller is a bit weird and when I move the control stick, the control pad kind of moves, well not moves, but it accepts inputs for the control pad even though I didn't move it, and if I move my control pad, then for some reason it does like R1 and L1 inputs, it's just weird. So uh, bear with me for this let's play. Also this isn't live, this is in post, just in case anybody was wondering. As for a short story summary, there isn't very much story in Shovel Knight, but what is there is pretty cute. I guess that's the word. Basically, a long time ago, the world was, I don't know, okay to travel in. You know, adventurers had a good time finding gold and stuff. And two adventurers, Shovel Knight and Shield Knight, decided to go into some special tower, but Shield Knight got locked inside the tower and... Shovel Knight decided that he was going to be a farmer instead. It fits. And then the tower suddenly opened up, so now Shovel Knight has to go to the tower and do whatever he's going to do there. Not a very large story. I guess that's the best way to put it, but it fits. It suffice. As for Shovel Knight himself, how he plays is very reminiscent to, uh, a lot of other kind of NES games, Castlevania, Mega Man, uh, Zelda 2. I don't really hear that one get brought up a lot, but I think it's very similar to Zelda 2, especially with his trademark shovel drop technique. Yeah, DuckTales kind of had it also, but the reason I say Zelda 2 is because he doesn't really bounce off of the ground, he bounces off of objects. For example, if he bounces off of these dirt blocks here, he'll get a little bit of a boost. If he bounces off of something like an enemy, for example this big dragon that takes 7 hits to kill and shoots out bubbles that are very easy to avoid if you just keep shovel dropping on his head, shovel dropping off of an enemy gets you much higher than just some object. And there are some specific objects that make you shovel drop as if you were, you know, bouncing off of an enemy, but those are specific cases, we'll get into those later. You can also dig up dirt piles in order to find 150 gold inside of them, and certain walls can be destroyed by your shovel. Though what's hidden behind them is very different depending on what wall you see, and certain walls aren't as telegraphed as others. As you can see on the far left here, that wall is very easily, you know, shown that you can break it, but certain other walls you won't be able to see that. You might have missed it because it was very fast, but there was a dirt pile on the wall there. You just have to shovel at the wall and then, um, smack the dirt pile once in order to get the money that's inside. And I picked up a music sheet. I'll get into why those are important later. But I will be doing a lot in this game. I'm going to be collecting every music sheet. I'm going to collect every special weapon within the levels. I'm not going to do it the other way. I won't talk about that for right now because we're not quite there yet and I will be getting as much money as possible because that is a very big focus in this game getting a lot of gold like already I have over 1500 gold and that number is gonna keep going up it can get pretty dang high over over 9,000 but uh collecting money very important for this game and I haven't taken a hit yet, so you can't really see it, but 
after breaking open that little, um, serving plate, or whatever you want to call it, there was chicken inside. Chicken, I think, restores your health to full, although we don't have very much health right now, and, in my opinion, health isn't really that much of a problem in this game. The real way that you're probably gonna die is by failing platforming challenges, because they are pretty difficult, like this right here. The bubbles, you have to bounce off of them and they give you a pretty high bounce, but after you do bounce off of them, they go away for a little bit. You have to wait for them to rise again, and if you're hesitant with your jumps or if you make a mistake, you're probably not going to be getting back to safe ground, and you'll go back to the previous checkpoint. There aren't lives in this game, but when you do die, you lose a bunch of money. and. It appears as money bags flying through the air. You can go back to wherever that money bag was and recollect the money. But that's not going to be much of a problem here. I do not plan on dying at all in this game. And these checkpoints, well, I'll get more into it a bit later. But uh, for now, just know that this isn't the design for a checkpoint that's usually appearing throughout the levels. This one's a bit special. Or rather, the ones in this level are a bit special. Another thing about um, money is that it doesn't really respawn. So say you kill an enemy and then die, you'll lose the money that um, you know drops out of Shovel Knight because he died, but the money doesn't respawn from enemies, so if you killed an enemy once already, it's not going to drop money again if it respawns is all I'm trying to say. And we have to fight another one of these dragons. I really don't like the placement of this. Uh, I do know how many hits it takes. It takes seven, so I know at the seventh bounce to start heading away from that pit. But the dragon also kind of lets its money drop through the pit, so you lose out on a little bit. That skeleton back there is very douchey, because if you run into him, uh, he probably will knock you off of that ledge. I'm not going to say that it's happened to me, but... You know, it can happen, is all I'm trying to say. Right, well, not right there, but a few seconds ago, I showed off a thing that I like to do in this game. Basically, canceling your shovel drop. If you're dropping off of something and you bounce off of something, you're stuck in that shovel dropping animation. Like, Shovel Knight still has his shovel pointing downward, so... If you do land on something else that's breakable, you're definitely going to break it. If you, however, attack while in the middle of that shovel dropping animation, Shovel Knight will go into his regular drop animation and whatever's underneath him doesn't break. So if you want to access certain things and doing so requires that you don't break what's underneath you, then cancelling your shovel drop is probably very important. Now we have the first boss of the game, Black Knight, and usually I like uh, fights that kind of have you going against someone with similar skills or similar weapons to you. Uh, I don't know, some examples, Sonic and Shadow in the Sonic series, um, I guess Link and Dark Link in whatever games that he appears in. I can't really think of anything else off the top of my head that isn't very spoilery. But a Shovel Knight versus Black Knight. Black Knight is a bit faster than you, so uh, if he does come rushing toward you, he will slash at you with his shovel. That takes away one little, well not an entire dot, but like half a dot. The dots are divided into two in your health. As you can see when I'm about to hit him, the dot got smaller, and if I hit him again, then it'll actually disappear. Black Knight can also take an entire dot away from you if he ends up hitting you with his shovel drop, which is pretty easy tele easily telegraphed. He'll jump high into the air and then um, kind of just drop straight down. And I got the feat, you're fired and I'm alive. Feats are basically uh, trophies, achievements. Achievements would probably be the better word. But uh, the feat, I'm alive, you get that for not dying through an entire level, and you're fired is the feat for reflecting Black Knight's shot back at him. You can tell that he's doing his shot because his shovel will glow purple for a bit, and he'll shoot a fireball at you. You can reflect the fireball with your own shovel. 
And I just like killing him like that. It's reminiscent of other Zelda games where, you know, you play Dead Man's Volley and you have to reflect the shots back at the boss or whatever you're going up against. And I came very close to missing that. Sometimes after clearing a level, uh, basically whenever you're accessing a new big area, and there's a feat, only you, as in only you can prevent forest fires for putting out that fire. Dream sequences. Whenever you unlock a new section of the world map, then you have a little dream with Sh Shovel Knight. And, well, Shield Knight as well. Shield Knight is falling and Shovel Knight has to try and catch her. That's kind of the gist of what happens. And here we have a bard who totally isn't Jake Kaufman, who is the uh, person who did a lot of the music for this game. If you have music sheets, he'll take them off your hands for 500 apiece, which is a pretty good way of making money. I had two, and usually there's two in each level, so that's like a thousand right there. In here we have the Gastronomer, the Magicist, and the Goatician. The Goatician will sell you some meal tickets, and what meal tickets are, are basically access to uh, extra health. You give it to the Gastronomer here, and he'll make you some special food that will extend your life bar by one dot. So, you know, it's good. It helps you stay alive for longer. The thing is though, the meal tickets can get pretty expensive eventually. Downstairs here we have some characters that are troubled by the various knights that have taken over the areas that they're, I guess, associated with. The dancer doesn't really have any association with, um, Spectre Knight's stage. And I don't, well, I don't think the witch has any association with anything else either. She just tells you certain facts, like how long you've been playing, how many times you've died, things like that. And the king back there is, you know, the previous king of a certain place, but, well, King Knight is now in that place, so he's not really ruling anymore. Anyway, this is Mona. She's not all that important of a character. She's basically, you know, a mini game right now. We need to hit these bottles. That's the word. I don't know why I was... It's because she called them just the things, and that was weird. You have to hit these bottles into these certain wall things, and depending on which one you hit, you get certain amount of points. The red ones at the top give you 10, the green ones on the side give you 3, and the bottom ones give you 1. The goal is to get, I think, more than 150 points, which honestly isn't that difficult to do. I've gotten over 200 pretty easily, and I'm about to get over 200 right here. But uh, for getting over 150 points, well, that was like a weird voice crack. You get a bunch of money, and you get a music sheet along with a um, feat slash achievement slash trophy. Over here we have another music sheet hidden in the wall, and Croker. Croker tells a bunch of puns, and he always tells the same pun the first time that you talk to him about throwing in the trowel. Haha. -ha. Here we have Chester, whose name is also a pun. He's a jester who hides in chests. You can buy certain relics from him. Relics are the special weapons in this game, and they have various effects, you know, depending on which one you have equipped. I'll show them off a bit later. First, I want to talk to this Trouble Acolyte. We'll deal with the Trouble in a bit, but you want to buy a chalice from him. It's pretty important. Over here on the other side of town, we have a girl playing with this hoop, and a hedge farmer who wants us to prove that we're the real Shovel Knight, so all we gotta do is just dig up this pile right here. And he's all excited. Very adorable. This lady carrying buckets actually is a platform that you can use to get up here and find a music sheet as well as a very well hidden chest. I honestly didn't notice my first time playing, it kind of blended in. Then again, my first time playing I wasn't paying a lot of attention to a lot of things. This playing kid right here talked about how nobody can outrun him, but you can run circles around him very, very easily. Now the hoop kid wants us to play, 
And by playing, she means shovel dropping off of her little hoop here. By doing it a bunch of times, I don't recall how many it is. Let me just count. I guess it's ten. Yeah, after doing it ten times, you get the feet. Hooper. I was thinking that it said hopper for a second. But, uh, basically, that's all you really get for it. Just an achievement. And I will be getting a lot of them. I'll try to get as many as I can, but some of them you can't really get during other playthroughs. Like, for example, we got earlier first purchase for buying the um, meal ticket. You can't get that during the same run as the run where you don't buy anything. That also gets you a different reward. Anyway, well, I say reward. Feet. Talking to the Magicist there, we can get an upgrade to our magic meter. It's really a number, but, you know, it does the same thing. Every time you buy an upgrade from her, she gives you 10 more points to your magic. And ultimately, the max is like 100 points. Uh, the relics that we currently have take up varying amounts of points depending on which one you use. I don't quite remember exactly how much each one does, though. Now, now that we have the... Uh, Tropical Chalice, we can get Icor from this Tropical King here. If we didn't have the Chalice, he wouldn't appear, nor would his other little Tropical dudes. S Excuse me. So, it is a good idea to get the Tropical Chalice. And depending on which Icor you get, you have various bonuses. The first one that I'm getting, and the one that I usually get whenever I come to the Tropical Pond, is I think called the... Icor of Renewal. It basically refills all your health and magic when you drink it. And the way you use it is pretty much like a relic. You select it, you press the button that it's, you know, that's your relic button, and you drink it. The Tropical King does a very long dance here, and I like to think that this dance is a reference to uh, Link's Awakening, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, because in that game there is a fish, a sunfish, who does a dance for you, and he gives you a special thing. I guess I won't spoil much more than that. For getting some Icor, we get Tropical Acolyte. And if we use the fishing rod that we brought from the Chester here, we can fish up a music note as long with, along with a bunch of apples. That's kind of weird that the fish are in the tree and the apples are underwater, but whatever. The way the fishing rod works, I guess I'll just get into that next part, because we're nearing the end of this one. Also, the bard here, depending on which music note you give to him, he'll have a little comment about it. You can talk to him and see his comments for every music note, but when you give him like more than one at a time, he just picks one at random and talks about it. Next time, we'll be heading to Pridemore Keep, the lair of King Knight. 